If your business is active in the warehousing and logistics sector, you know what it's like to have to think on your feet and be super responsive. Our dedicated multidisciplinary warehousing and logistics team works closely with manufacturers, retailers, developers, and logistics companies to bring clarity and resolution to issues relating to retail logistics, transportation, warehousing and fulfillment, employment matters, and the construction and operation of distribution centers. With the ongoing e-commerce revolution driving a significant increase in demand for warehousing space across the UK, together with a boom in the development of mega sheds, there's never been a better time to discover the difference that expert legal advice from Freeths can make to the success of your warehousing and logistics investment or operation. Freeths Warehousing and Logistics, keeping your business moving. Hi everyone and welcome. I am Simon King, National Director of Business Development at Freeths. I hope you are well and thank you for joining us this afternoon for day four of our Sector Week webinars. And a first in the series of logistics and warehousing, uh, where we'll be hosting a number of these throughout the year. So we're privileged to have on our panel of experts today from Fries, Shashi Chamber, real estate partner, Nigel Gardner, commercial partner, Lindsay Clegg, dispute resolution partner, Ian Bowler, partner and head of commercial, Lee Ashwood, employment director, and Chris Holwell, Head of Construction and Engineering. We'll soon be starting the panel discussion, but before we do so, I just want to confirm there will be an opportunity to submit questions during the talk. So please do so, uh, as we really want to make this session as interactive as we can. You can submit your questions via the Q&A function on Zoom during the session. If unfortunately we don't get round to answer your question, we will follow up with you directly over the next few days. Now, just to give you some uh, background, as we all know, Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic has affected every part of the supply chain, causing significant disruption for many businesses and significant growth for others. While these events have adversely affected many sectors, those operating in the logistics and warehousing sector have seen customer demand soar creating a different set of challenges for business leaders to overcome, from labour changes to increased transportation costs and the rising demands and expectations of the end customer. Uh, with that background, I'm going to go straight to the panel with the first question. Uh, looking back over the last couple of years, what do the panellists see are the key learnings from Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic? Shashi, can I come to you first? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for that, Simon. Um, so as Simon briefly explained, uh, my background is real estate. So I'll be looking at that question purely from a real estate point of view. Uh, most of the work that I and my team undertake, I primarily on the occupier and owner part, part of the market. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll look at that uh, specifically. So the 2021 figures um, or 2021 figures show an increase in warehouses in terms of size of warehouses, we're talking about uh, medium to larger. So a minimum of uh, 50,000 square foot um, in that particular market and sector, more than 70 million square foot was either sold or let during the course of the year. That's in, according to um, figures released by Cushman and Wakefield. That's a more than 33% increase from 2020, the year before. Their report also suggests that the trend is very much for quality. There was more than 40 million square foot of newly developed warehouse space in 2021, which exemplifies that demand for new and good quality space. The demand was unsurprisingly fueled by online retail sales and the on online retail sector particularly during 2020, um, you probably uh, will remember that high streets were shut, uh, offices were shut, people were at home uh, and ordering away. Uh, and certainly back at my house, Mrs. Chambers was doing her bits as well. Um, as a result, e-commerce operators accounted for about a, a third, 33% or so of the total take up of logistics space. As we unlocked during the course of 2021, uh, multi-channel retailers began to take more warehouse space to serve both their online and store-based 
retail networks. So there has been obviously a rebalancing once the, um, the high streets and the retailers are opening up again in terms of bricks and mortar um, retailing. 3PLs and logistic providers, well, they were also acquisitive during 2021. Um, they make up about 22% of the total acquisition market. Um, so effectively building up more inventory to cope with that demand uh, and the supply chain disruptions we've seen. So in short, COVID hasn't really negatively impacted on the warehousing market. Rents have remained relatively strong throughout the period. Um, so if we look um, at the hotspot of Northampton and Northamptonshire, for example, um, they're at sort of between £7.50 and £7.75 per square foot, which is up from about £6.50 per square foot last year and about £5.50 before the pandemic. So rents have, have, have made, you know, uh, maintained at a strong level and do reflect that continuing demand. Lots of agents that you speak to speak about deals being done with no discount. Um, other factors, obviously, that reflect rental value includes location, proximity to major road systems and hubs, key population areas, um, the price of developing land, and obviously staff costs. Nonetheless, sheds are seen as a very strong asset class with lots of interest from funds and particularly foreign investors, which continues to have that positive push on land price. Thank you, Simon. Nigel. Um, hello, everyone. Um, coming at this from the perspective of, of a commercial lawyer, um, what we've seen is uh, an acceleration, rapid acceleration of some trends that were were already there that have just really come into focus because of the challenges that um, Brexit and COVID uh, dealt with. Um, I'm just going to touch on three three areas. There are obviously several. Um, there's been a, a much greater focus on uh, supply chain management. I mean, that's a broad term, but it does encompass the sense that um, because of the challenges, there's a lot more focus on how, how do we work this? How are we going to operate more efficiently? How are we going to meet increased demand? How are we going to save on the increased expenditure involved in all this? And so what you find, what, what I've certainly seen at every stage of the supply chain, if you like, is a greater focus on, on efficiency and process and making things work um, better because the increased demand that came because of the room that um, Shashi spoke about in terms of um, uh, at home um, online purchasing, it, it, it boosted demand in such a way that everyone all of a sudden had huge demand um, to cope with. So it's been looking at how, how the processes are managed um, and that's everything from at the manufacturer end to the getting it home end, uh, the, so, you know, the last mile delivery, which I'll, which I'll touch on um, in my comments. The last mile delivery, what we're talking about here is getting it from the, to your home, essentially. Uh, and uh, everybody involved in the chain is looking at ways in which to make that more efficient, to make that competitive because it's such a key area. You and I are at home, we order our things, we want them quickly. That sensation of having bought something online, the expectation that goes with it, of having it almost immediately which is very, very difficult to achieve, as you can imagine. And there's a lot of focus gone into ways of getting stuff to us um, as quickly as possible. Um, one of the reasons there are so many sheds popping up and uh, up and down the land is that obviously people are trying to get these sheds closer to where we all live. So the time it takes to come out of the shed into our homes uh, is reduced. People are looking at different ways in which delivery can take place. Uh, in, in, in the last mile to improve the speed and efficiency uh, and the cost involved in the process. So that's a, that's a big area of that so Describing um, both these things, supply chain management, improving the last mile, is, a, is an increasing use of technology. Um, that's, that's informing all the big developments uh, in the sector as people are looking at ways in which technology can improve the supply chain process and experience some of that is not just getting robots to do what humans were previously doing, but it's also it's complementing what, what, what humans were doing. And it's also, in some respects, 
enable the redeployment of people to do the stuff that only people could do and, and use these automation uh, capacities to do stuff which would otherwise have been dull and routine for individuals to do. Huge amount of investment going on in technology as people are looking at ways in which to improve um, the experience and the delivery of the service from the beginning to the end of the supply chain. Thanks, Thanks Nigel. Lee, Lee, what are you saying? Well, I, I'm an employment lawyer, um, so I'm going to say, aren't I, that, that you know we've seen a lab, we've seen labour shortages in the sector, and we're seeing labour shortages across the UK at the moment, and that's bringing some real challenges into the sector at the moment, uh, and and that's placing a real emphasis on human resources. And I wrote an article about this in Supply Management magazine earlier in the year, and it, it, it's it's forcing businesses to think about their recruitment processes. They need to be swifter and sharper, quicker off the mark, as it were, I think. And they need to be thinking about sort of casting their net wider as to who they're willing to take on as employees as well, all at the same time without sort of reducing the standard of, of, of the employee that they're taking on. That, that brings challenges that, that need to be addressed. The shortages, of course, and I think we're all painfully aware, and, and, and my colleagues here on, on, on the panel will talk about rising costs, but I'm seeing rising costs in terms of salaries at the moment a huge causing real problems to businesses about how they're going to address it and at the same time it's it's making sure that you appreciate that that rising rising salaries aren't the only way of retaining staff there's two things at play there one there are other ways of retaining staff which don't have a, a tangible cost to your to your bottom line in the way that a salary rise does and and two we're starting to see workers who are wanting to embed themselves with businesses that have values and traits that they that they that they treasure and so they and so they want pride in in where they work and, and and that you know often particularly in the in the warehouse and logistics sector tends to revolve around ESG the green values and and, and so on and, and I know that probably then makes my colleagues eyebrows on this on this panel sort of sort of raise their eyebrows because they'll be talking about rising costs in a different way and ESG in a different way but but certainly from my perspective those are, those are what I see as the challenges. Excellent. Thank, thanks for some really interesting perspectives there. But looking ahead, where does the panel see the sector evolving over the next few years? And what do you feel are the current challenges facing business leaders in the sector? Lee, I'm going to come to you again on this one. Yeah, well, as I was just saying, thanks for that, Simon. I was just saying, it, it, for, from, from an employment perspective, it's understanding how much it's going to cost to employ staff in the future. And what it means to retain staff as well. And, and we saw last week, for example, the um, logistics staff of ASDA uh, with, the, with the backing of the GMB trade union have been talking about bringing, uh, bringing strike action over the pay arrangements they have there. Yesterday, it was being reported that the London depots of Wincanton, the HDG drivers there are talking about um, strike action. And we've not seen strike action in the UK being threatened for, for years. It simply hasn't happened. And, and, and it really has come about upon employers very, very quickly. And, and it applies not just to trade union workforces. It applies to workforces as well, because workforces, whether they're, they're trade unionized or not, will understand for the first time in probably a decade that they have a real value to a client. And when Nigel talks about the excitement of getting something very quickly to your doorstep, it, we're in the modern day equivalent of, of dustman strikes from the from the 1980s when when dustman realized that if they really wanted to make a political statement and, and put their employers under pressure it was to stop picking up dustbins outside people's houses similarly workforces now whether we like it or not are realizing that as the world is revolving around the immediacy of delivery supply chains into supermarkets supply to to front doorsteps that they actually have some sway and they have sway not just because of the immediacy of all of that but because there's a shortage of them by which i mean workers and that is going to be a real challenge for businesses in the next two or three years is, is, is maintaining staff keeping salary costs down and at the same time continuing to keep supply chains open and and that is, is probably going to sort of reflect in terms of costs which i'm sure i don't know sashi or someone will probably have comments about costs and things as a challenge as well Leads me on nicely into you, Shashi. You're on mute. Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry, I knew that was going to happen. There's always one in there, and it's it's always me. Um, yeah, no, thanks for that, Lee. Yeah, just picking up on that. Um, it, it just so a general comment, really, that the sector has had to be nimble and agile during the pandemic. And frankly, you know, it, it's had no choice um, apart from COVID and Brexit. We've had increasing regulations, more sustainable um, uh, regulations for more sustainable supply chains. Uh, we've, we've spoken about customer demand. So standing still was never an option. Um, you know, never before has the global supply chain been faced with such disruption. So, you know, there are a number of challenges. Um, so, you know, for me, firstly, the, the global demand and capacity issue is, is the biggest one. Um, so given where global trade and consumer behavior has got to, it's put a spotlight on a system which was, for me, already under pressure. Uh, mm -hmm. So over the last couple of years, flights have been grounded, air cargo volumes were hit, uh, shipping's been hit. So that in terms of modes of um, logistics and um, supply chain maneuvering, um, those have been under particular strain, uh, shortage of containers, delays on trade deals, um, rising container costs. So the, the, the global picture has been put under strain. Um, the, the second challenge that I wanted to address really was, was visibility and transparency in the supply chain. Um, we've already touched on this, but customers effectively want an improved service and complete supply chain transparency. And that's whether you're a consumer or whether you are a retailer or manufacturer. Uh, we want delivery yesterday, we want real-time tracking, and we want uh, re-delivery uh, re options. So that creates the need for that you know, versatile, complicated supply chain solution, um, particularly in those sectors such as manufacturing and, and some car manufacturing that relies on just-in-time supply chain um, uh, movements. Uh, we've seen that um, over the pandemic where actually like a domino effect that manufacturing plant can come to a standstill quite quickly um, if uh, there's disruption within the supply chain. So that need for uh, a highly visible, highly responsive and efficient delivery process is only set to continue. Um, Sorry, Fergie. Yeah, I'll just quickly touch on, on, on rising costs. Um, as, as Lee pointed out, everything is heading in one direction. So the costs of labour, construction, uh, and Chris perhaps can talk a bit more about that, um, staff, energy, fuel, uh, vehicles, materials, everything is headed in one direction and has gone up um, over the last couple of years. Yet um, on the consumer side uh, and also on the retailer and manufacturing side, that they, they're effectively screaming for their delivery fees to come down. So, you know, that, that something has to give and it's just not sustainable. Um, increased regulation also means increased costs. Um, new customs rules following Brexit, um, increased regulations relating to safety, sustainability, uh, having more efficient vehicles, more efficient buildings, constructing in, in, you know, um, in a more efficient way, uh, and the pressure to reduce your carbon footprint. All of that adds to operating costs. And the last point I just want to add uh, very quickly uh, is the shortage of actual good quality real estate. Um, I've seen that in, 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 in the team that we work in, uh, that good quality space is actually hard to come by in certain areas. So logistics providers are primarily led by location and size, and there's certainly a supply issue in certain parts of the market. Ian, how are you seeing the, the sector evolving? Thanks, Simon. Um, I think, you know, Shashi and Lee have covered some uh, really important points there, but there are three, three or four additional points I want to pull out. The first, which Shashi's already touched on, but from a cost point of view, but I just want to touch on the compliance and the risk issues around tightening regulations. Um, regulations around corruption, fraud, export controls, sanctions, in particular we're seeing at the moment, labour laws, um, customer privacy, cyber security, etc., um, health and safety. I mean, those uh, those compliance obligations have, uh, have multiplied many fold over the last few years, and um, organisations now are being faced um, or, or forced to, to take responsibility for compliance and, and oversight 
across all of the, the tiers uh, um, uh, in the supply chain. And that imposes potentially financial liability uh, and even potentially the risk of losing the contract if it's not just you, but actually other members in uh, other um, players in the, in the supply chain in different tiers that you're responsible for uh, cause, you know, cause issues. Um, we're seeing in some places that this, this is being codified. So if you look at Germany's uh, Supply Chain Act, um, you know, that requires companies to draft and adopt uh, a policy statement on human rights, to carry out risk assessments, to engage in risk management, uh, and to provide transparent uh, reporting in relation to uh, both direct and indirect suppliers. Um, the other thing um, Lee mentioned, ESG, uh, and actually I think you know, uh, the ethical integrity of supply chain these days is probably becoming just as important as operational integrity. Um, people want to do business um, with um, uh, businesses that um, operate on ESG compliant principles. Um, and I think you know, the discovery of corruption or bribery or exploitation or non-compliance with, with environmental standards or cruelty, etc., you know, can have an immediate effect on, uh, on businesses, um, both from a, a business viability and in terms of market capitalization. And I think you know, um, we're in a hypervigilant uh, world these days, uh, and I think what businesses need to do through their procurement activities you know, are, um, you know, sub, uh, carry out vetting operations, uh, monitoring processes to ensure that there is, there is transparency in their supply chain to ensure, you know, that, that ethical practices work across the entire supply network. So what can businesses do about this? Well, I think, you know, they need, you need to gear up. Um, you need to be able to fully understand and address what these risks are. Uh, and how you're going to respond to them, whether that's you know internally through a general counsel or a chief legal officer or a compliance officer or a sustainability director, um, or, or in fact you know, outsourcing some of these risk management issues to your lawyers, uh, to specialist consultants or whatever. Um, two other very quick points to mention just in terms of challenges. I think we're going to probably talk about automation uh, a little bit later on. But the whole, the, the whole piece around uh, automation and the speed of adoption of automation, you know, what to automate, when to automate, how to automate, and are you going to be able to get the return on that investment? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, improving, I think it's important for, for uh, logistics companies to be able, even more so these days, to be able to demonstrate the value proposition, mm -hmm. um, to be able to demonstrate that they're a valued business partner uh, rather than a, re a replaceable supplier, um, particularly when they're being asked to invest in real estate, in technology, and so forth, um, short-term contracts really are—you know—they're uh, a huge limiting factor on being able to recover those costs of investment, which customers are demanding at the moment. Excellent, thank you, Ian. I knew there'd be a question on on risk, so we've actually seen the supply chain come under pressure. Uh, particularly with Brexit and, and COVID, but what should businesses be doing to help manage risk in the supply chain? Nigel, can I come to you first on this one? Um, um, just touching, following on from what um, Ian was just saying, uh, with the uh, number of uh, regulation, regulation and legal um, challenges that, that, uh, and changes that, um, that, are, that are present now, I think one of the things that businesses have to do is they need to identify what their risk is. Um, um, some things are obvious um, because there are laws about them. You can apply obviously sanctions um, will come under increased focus because of what's going on now. So there's a sort of there's a statutory framework and there's some legal stuff in other ways that people have to comply with, but there's also the whole often, um, Business and working out where things could go wrong uh, in your in your supply chains, where if, if if things don't go according to plan, you might be under pressure, and how you would cope with that pressure. I think businesses need to understand what the landscape um, uh, looks like uh, for them. Um, I think another thing that um, businesses need to do. I've seen a lot of this over the past um, two or three years. 
look at ways of collaborating because obviously one of the ways that you can cope with the increasing challenges that you as a business is to work out ways in which you can partner with people who know stuff more than you and that you can find some sort of synergy in. Um, I think a lot of the challenges around cost and the other challenges that I've seen have been met in part by businesses in the chain working together. I've seen a lot of uh, retailers supporting some of the providers to them, some of the manufacturers for them in terms of cash flow and support, recognition, the type of demand and the I think there's a lot to be said for exploring ways in which you can collaborate with your existing supply chain, but also thinking outside the box of ways in which you can bring on expertise that you don't necessarily have within your business, but you can see ways in which it can, it, it can improve um, your, your operating uh, uh, methods. Um, I'll keep going back to technology, the need to invest in technology and people because it's so key to everything that's going on in this sector uh, and others. One of the key ways of meeting the challenges that are, are, are presented in this day and age is working out ways in which you can use the benefits of automation or mm. AI or software to improve your processes, to improve the way you do things. Um, it takes, it obviously takes investment and it takes an analysis of, of how you're going to get your return on that investment, what, what's not, because obviously there's a lot of exploratory tech out there at the moment, which is untested. And so there's an element of, do we take the plunge now or do we wait until this is more, a more tried and tested thing? Um, I want to just touch on the, as much as I'm talking about technology, I don't, I think people are still key to all of this. And the smart, the smart uh, business people recognize that investing in their people is, will, and always will be one of the best ways to uh, ensure success. Um, and so I think there's a lot of good work going on in terms of training people up into using new tech when it comes around, getting people to understand how the supply chain works in their particular business and ways in which they can improve the oversight of that. Mm. Great. Thank you, Nigel. Lindsay, what are, what are you seeing? Oh, thank, thank you, Simon. From um, the perspective of a disputes lawyer, um, obviously the place where I'm usually asked to start looking at things for a client is to um, to go back um, and look at their contract, see how robust that is and what protections the parties have agreed between themselves and um, what there is, is in there to help um, a client. Um, Actually, um, absolute obligations on a um, supplier to supply you with something or to do something are actually less common than you, you might think. And it can be very difficult if you are um, if you can't reach agreement to convince a court, even, even in a contract where there is an absolute obligation to, um, to force someone to do something. The courts, absent something that's particularly unique about that product or service, do not like compelling um, parties that don't for whatever reason, want to work together to um, to have to do so. That said, if you've got something absolute um, and very solid in your contract, it is useful leverage. It always is um, to push yourself to the front of the queue, particularly as it was, we've seen quite a lot where supplier, suppliers just do not, for, for the various reasons that we've seen um, affecting the market, have the resource or something has happened. That means they can't fulfill, fulfill all of their order book and they're having to... Um, pick and choose um so i mean the obvious point is if, if you if you're the one that they think they have to supply they're more likely to push you to the front but what else could you do to push yourself to the front as a few i've seen examples in some contracts where there's been a designated um capacity or a, a kind of a right to, to occupy the, the, the kind of the, the priority role on the production line when it's up and running um can you, it's quite rare in a, it's like a framework agreement for a supplier, for a, um, a supplier to have to accept, be bound to accept a purchase order. Your big obligation only arises when that is accepted. But you can, can, is there any way you can bring that forward? Um, you, you might face some reluctance to do so, but can you make, make some binding when you um, submit a reasonable forecast? Um, what else can you do to, to kind of, to make yourself, um, and in the in the priority zone when there, there is limited resource to be um, 
handed around. around. However, what what we've seen seen much more of um, coming through both Brexit and COVID, and as Nigel has mentioned, there's been a real move towards collaboration. Um, rather than people are adopting an aggressive approach um, and going in with a strong letter, going in and in, in waving waving their contracts and, and asserting their rights, it's actually people have picked up the phone. They've worked together to try and um, move, uh, get goods moving and get things to market. Appreciating that we've all faced some very very difficult challenges over the last few years, and um, with current events, a lot of those ch or difficult challenges are, um, are likely to continue for um, a few months and, and possibly years ahead. The one thing I would say, um, and the one kind of big learning point um, for people that I've seen over the last couple of years is you do, even in the when, when you're collaborating with people and you're working together, you do need to think about protecting your, your position while you're while you're doing so. Um, so just a couple of a couple of brief tips from a, a disputes lawyer. If you are picking up the phone to someone and you're thinking about varying a contract, you've got a problem, you're you want to give them a, as much heads up as you can. Make sure those initial conversations are expressed and agreed to be on a without prejudice so, um, basis. So that's that's they are um, conversations that are intended to um, resolve a dispute. And if they're protected by without prejudice privilege, they can't be referred to um, before a court um, if the dispute ends up there and the courts has to determine um, who is ultimately liable. Always keep contemporaneous notes of those discussions. You never know when they'll come in handy um, and you might need to refer back to them. And think about protecting your position in, in the interim. You might be um, willing to go into negotiations with the best will in the world to try and sort things out. But if, if something ha hasn't been done that should have been done, if something is late, make sure you register a formal objection, you reserve your rights while you're having those discussions um, in parallel. Um, if you do delay in raising some, something like a breach of contract, um, particularly where you've got a right to terminate that contract, then that delay could be seen as acceptance of the breach. It could be seen as an affirmation of the contract and you could ultimately inadvertently um, lose the right to do something that you, you might want to do so. If you do reach agreement, if you agree to extend a time period, if you agree to vary pricing or, or do something else that varies the strict contractual obligations, um, then just make sure you document that, you document it accurately um, and that you follow, there, there should be a clause in the contract which tells you how you vary the contract, you follow that to the letter if it needs to be in writing, if it needs to be signed then make sure um, it follows those requirements so you're not hit with an argument at a future date when everything's settled down that actually what you thought was agreed hasn't been agreed. Um, if you are, if things, think things go badly wrong and you're thinking about terminating, there are all kinds of risks around terminating. So I would always say if your lawyer's about that. Um, and if you need to serve a notice, so if there's a breach, you want to serve a notice, quite often a party in breach will be given 30 or 45 days to rectify that, to set it right. Um, make sure you follow the requirements for serving that notice to the letter, um, just so you've got that, that protection in place. Um, and where, where you've got a problem, make sure you keep, don't delete documents, don't delete emails, make sure you keep them. You could fall under a duty to disclose them and you, they might be useful to you in the future. And also be very careful, don't, don't create don't create unhelpful documents. Don't commit things to paper that you would be embarrassed if they weren't before the, the court if you had to disclose them. So um, yeah, just be just just think twice before you send that email or you um, write something in a in a memo to, to a colleague. Great, thank thank you, Lindsay. Clearly a case of tread carefully. Ashley, anything to to add? Yeah, just more, slightly more on a general uh, footing, really, and, and none of this is particular rocket science. Um, f firstly, and I think we've touched on this already, is, is, is that supply chain resilience. So businesses in the sector really must test the model, um, you know, given the, the curveballs that we've had recently with COVID and Brexit that we've mentioned, but also turbulence on the financial markets, retailer insolvencies, um, you know, businesses uh, have more sophisticated and tested mitigation and emergency strategies these days. Um, so we all are aware of the what if scenario um, in, in, you know, in, in volatile times. And we, we've got to be able to, you know, test uh, our supply chain. Um, so companies are resorting to dual sourcing of raw materials, um, thinking about domestic production, or the wider supplier, you know, having a wider or alternative supplier base. So it's the old adage of, you know, not singularly relying on China or, or, or more recently Russia 
um, for, for, for your supply chain requirements. Um, embrace technology. Um, and uh, I think um, Ian is going to talk uh, more about uh, hard or um, physical technology. Mm. And we, we know that logistics companies have he invested heavily in technology um, from robotic systems, warehouse automation, um, artificial intelligence powered technology platforms, drones, um, state of the art fleet vehicles, um, but there's also soft technology, which, which is an important part of the sector. Uh, we're not far away from a screen and the use of sophisticated supply chain software means um, that you know, everyone in the supply chain has that real-time visibility and transparency of the process. But, but not, not only from the customer facing side, also from the operational side as well. Um, I read an article yesterday about Amazon and uh, DPD using um, um, a software solution to manage staff uh, rotating shifts within the warehouse. All of that is designed to make um, you know, improving efficiencies, productivity, uh, but also reducing risks and costs in the supply chain. So technology is very important. Uh, the other thing that I would just like to add really is uh, almost a bit of a, a lawyer gripe, if I may, is, is, is planning early. So again, really stating the obvious, but we see this regularly uh, as lawyers and project lawyers and again, uh, Chris may want to touch on this as well. Uh, we um, see regularly projects that are pulled together in a rush with experts shipped in very late in the day. So, you know, investment in people, investment in real estate and investment in technology solutions, they, you know, they all must be carried out with that careful thought and planning and pre-planning, in fact. Um, you know, things can be found. You can find the right warehouse you know, the, the skilled member of the workforce, the, the tech that will save you time and, 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 and cut your costs. Um, but those best solutions are really found if the business plans well in advance. Um, so success can depend on that contingency planning and a flexible attitude towards change. Things don't always work out as originally planned and, you know, and, and you know, day to day, my job shows that that, that that happens. The last point, and this may or may not apply to everyone, but outsourcing. Um, I just wanted to mention that because, you know, a, a, a number of particularly larger retailers and manufacturers that obviously operate their own logistics and warehousing functions. Um, and, you know, that might be rightly so, and they've considered the, the cost and risk analysis and decided that that's the right thing. But I think every now and again, people in those sectors and retailers, manufacturers and suppliers should really consider whether it is worthwhile doing it for themselves. Uh, for some, you know, they may be well better served by outsourcing uh, their supply chain requirements. Um, and by doing so, you know, are they decreasing liabilities, shifting the risk, um, improving customer experience, both um, for, for themselves and, and for their ultimate customers? Um, and then, you know, it allows them to focus on their core business and their, their own critical operations. So it's certainly something to bear in mind. So, so you know, those are the sort of points that came to mind for me, Diane. Great, thank you, Shashi. Well, you probably preempted my next question, which is going to be on technology. So technology is continuing to have a significant impact on the sector. How can business leaders gain the benefits of automation and also manage the staffing and skills implications? Can I come to you, Ian, first on this one, please? Uh, thanks, Simon. Um, I'm going to leave Lee to talk about staffing implications. Um, I mean, actually, just picking up on what Shashi said there it reminded me of an expression. You see, I think it comes from the military originally, um, referred to called, people called the six P's, um, which are, um, uh, people may know about, but which is proper planning and preparation prevents poor performance. Um, and I think that's uh, that, that's certainly true when you're talking about or thinking about automation. Um, I mean, the logistics industry has always been progressive, you know, and um, automation's nothing new from the first time when people started moving goods around by steam train, oh. you know, to the arrival of forklifts, you know, it's not a long way from today's um, uh, sort of uh, situation with automated pickers and packers, swarm robots moving racks around, you know, bringing them to a stationary picking robot, uh, delivery bots in the last five, in the last, in the final mile, 
uh, and even uh, e-fulfillment uh, centers attached to airships to blimps being moved around the skies over you know major cities depending upon you know where demand sits um, uh, and, and I, but I think the case for automation uh, is different I think it's different in the in for logistics companies as it is for parcel delivery uh, just as a for example I think with parcel delivery you know, the increase in demand, uh, the requirements for speed and reliability, uh, I think really lends itself to the fact that parcel companies need to automate uh, and, and are automating at a huge rate of knots. Uh, logistics companies, uh, I don't think the, the decision is so clear cut. Uh, automation certainly adds efficiency, uh, it adds speed, but, and I'm sure Lee will come to this, but I think automated processes are less adaptable uh, and the less flexible uh, the, than a human workforce. But I, I think it's inevitable that we will see, we are seeing and will continue to see that, you know, we'll see fully automated uh, high rack warehouses with um, uh, AGVs, automated guide, uh, automated guide vehicles navigating the aisles. We'll see managers with augmented reality glasses um, who are able to see the entire operation uh, um, you know, in, in front of them so they can both coordinate the robots and the people. Yeah. Um, we'll see warehouse management systems, Shashi talked about software, um, which will keep track of inventory in real time and link with the ordering system uh, and with goods dispatch. And we'll see 3D printers cranking out spares um, for the system, you know, actually on, in, in location. But I think all of that, you know, has risks attached to it. One of the one of the key issues for me is is how is the interface between a, a, a AGVs, these automated guided vehicles, and and you could be talking about uh, you know uh, swarm bots in warehouses. You could be talking about self driving uh, um, delivery vehicles in due course, um, and how those AGVs interface with humans. Uh, and when things go wrong, when there's an accident, you know who's going to be liable for that? Is it going to be the manufacturer of the kit? Is it going to be the people that wrote the algorithms uh, and the, um, yeah. the AI that uh, enables them to do what they do? How do you put liability on the software house yeah. or do you put liability on the software house when uh, a robot using um, either machine learning or, um, yeah. or AI has, has gone off piste because it's taught itself to do so? You know, or, or does, the, does the responsibility fall on the operator? Um, so huge questions about risk allocation. Um, and you know, and how, what are the benefits of this? Well, I think for customers, uh, the benefits are obvious in terms of reduced reduced cost, oh. uh, increased um, uh, speed, increased reliability. But I think also, if you put all your eggs in one basket, basket into an into an automated RDC, you've got a single point of failure. Oh. Um, and this raises another point around you know the the lack of symmetry between the risks, the financial consequences for a, for a retailer if, uh, if a, an RDC goes down for a couple of hours and they can't get product to 70 stores in a particular region um, uh, versus the amount of liability that the 3PL service provider is prepared to accept if that happens. Um, and so lots of, lots of big commercial issues um, uh, that, that really complicate uh, but necessarily so, you know, the, the, the negotiation and the agreement of the commercial terms in these, in, in, in where, when you're putting these automated pro projects in place. Oh. Lee, what about the, the human factor in this? Yeah, that falls to me, doesn't it? The, the, the human resources line. <laughs> um, yeah, because staffing and automation generally are seen as really quite mutually exclusive. You, are, you either have staff or you have robots. I, I, and, you know, that's quite a black and white way of looking at it. And I've worked with warehouses where we've got bots we've replaced humans a long time ago, apart from in jobs that, that the bots can't yet do, where actually, you know, intelligence is needed and, 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 and being fleet of foot, if you like, in the task that's being done is beyond currently oh. the technology that we have. And I've worked right at the other end of the scale with warehouses where, you know, chitty sheets are printed off and pick sheets are printed off and people walk around a warehouse with a shopping trolley and there's a tannoy to shout at them. So I've worked right across the spectrum. And it, and it means I've seen a lot of automation introduced over the last few years. And, and there's a few things I've seen that, that really a, a sort of people can take away the introduction of automation is is quite divisive it's very divisive within a workforce because it is seen 
almost inevitably is the precursor to job losses. It's not seen as anything else. And, and, and Shashi talked about sort of people being trained to use technology, and that's absolutely right. It's also quite a divisive issue in the, in the in sort of wider society, if you like. It is either the future, and it's all about labour saving, and, and we'll have better lives as a result of robots being able to do jobs that we don't want to do, so we'll be able to free, um, free ourselves to pen poetry or to put on plays and, and so forth. Or it is seen, you know, as, as, as a way of ending the workforce and ending salaries and so on. So it, it, and, and all that means is that businesses have to be really careful when they're talking about introducing automation as to how they message that both externally to customers to make sure that, that customers are in line with, 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 what they, with what they're expecting and that they're seeing that values of the business are still being met and the values that they respect in businesses are still being met. And, and also very, very importantly, I think it has to be very carefully messaged to your current workforce mm -hmm. and how it's perceived. And, and at the moment, I mentioned earlier about sort of trade unions and workforces realising their, their importance, that there's, there's a balance to that being brought at the moment is that <laughs> with labour shortages, Businesses, if they're fleet of foot at the moment, can think very carefully about introducing automation because it can fill gaps that the labour shortages have brought about. And it presents you with a very, very powerful message to justify the introduction, introduction of automation that we haven't had in the last 10, 15 years. When, you know, we, when we've needed people for the purposes of the economy to be in employment, we're now very much the other way. And so there is a good opportunity here for businesses to take stock of where they are in terms of labour and think about how they can fill gaps with automation and provide that with a very positive message. Yeah. And, and that's that's warehouses. Ian touched upon sort of final final um, final mile delivery and automation. And there's, and there's a question in our um, in our um, question session for, for, for here that, that talks about the, the Starship delivery robots in, in, yes. in Milton Keynes and, and Northampton. Oh. I mean, from an employment lawyer's perspective, my, 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 my colleagues here will have more of a view than, than I do. I think we will see in the next 10 years, we, we've seen an awful lot of battles in the courts. People have heard about the gig economy, self-employed workers who are modern day slaves who are you know required to pay pay paid a pound per delivery and they don't receive mm -hmm. minimum wage they don't receive holiday pay and we've seen all the negative press around that i, I think it's possible and i'm not prepared to put too much of a, a, a bet on it i think it's possible that with automation we may well see the end of that sector of our economy i think <coughs> you know delivery robots will improve um and we will see them replacing humans um now Ian and Sashi and Nigel and, and, and Lindsay and Chris are probably all much more up to speed on that. But certainly from my from my human resources perspective, that's my that's my view in respect of those. And we, we could we could actually you've, you've led me nicely into that question. Whether anybody else wants to to add to that, the, the question was: What is the feedback on the Starship delivery robots being used in Milton Keynes and Northampton? Your patch, Shashi. Do they yeah. have limited real capability given the practical issues? involved yeah i'm um, more than happy to start on that one simon um yeah so obviously i, I work in milton keys office so we, we've actually had them in place for for several years now so when we talk about automation and technology and change and uh driverless vehicles um you know they've, they've been you know these little bots and i don't know whether anyone's seen those sort of uh, cube shaped objects which go up and down the redways in Milton Keynes. Um, uh, 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 so cyclists need to be aware. Um, th th so they've been in place uh, for several years, but they do have their limitations, and it's the obvious ones their size. Um, they're not very big, so they don't carry very much. So they can um, deliver your takeaway, they can deliver some small shopping, but perhaps not enough for a, a week for a family. Um, they, uh, you know, they, their batteries have a limited time frame. So, uh, you know, they'll skirt across one side of town to, to the other and then back. And then, you know, how, how many more deliveries can they do during the course of the day before they need a recharge? Right. So, and, but that battery technology is obviously forever evolving and forever developing and, and they will get better, uh, and size wise, they will get bigger at the moment. Those two present um challenges i guess um so they're very local uh, the, the other thing is you know people aren't prepared to pay for delivery mm -hmm. so um you know nigel spoke about that expectation and excitement you order things and it's the amazon economy that we live in 
um, where you know your, your your shoulders drop if you have to pay a few pounds for a local delivery, and you think, well, you know, other retailers or other suppliers may may have free delivery. So if we're driving down the the delivery cost, where we already have spoken about increased pricing, so you know, where is that investment going to come from? So you know, where is the investment in that technology? Yes there are pressures to run a more sustainable model and, and to drive our carbon emissions down. So, you know, we, we don't necessarily want uh, someone driving around delivering our takeaways in the town. If that can be um, uh, automized, then all the better. But where, you know, who's going to pay for that investment when we don't want to pay for the delivery? So, it, you know, there are a number of challenges, but it, it does work. Uh, it works well, um, but there are limitations. That, so that's our experience here in Milton Keynes. Excellent. Well, we've we've spoken a lot about um, automation and contracts, which leads me nicely to the next question, which looks like it's heading for you, Chris, on this one. What are the key issues around the interfaces between distribution center construction contracts and automation contracts? <laughs> I, I I think that the, there are various issues relating to the interfaces, and one of them is is the obvious insurance and risk uh, issue. That if if you've got a hundred million pound building with a hundred million pounds of automation kit in it, and somebody then puts a hundred million pounds of stock into it, mm. does everybody need to have three hundred million pounds of insurance if a little wheel overheats and burns the building down? Um, and so the risk allocation and the insurance behind it uh, is, is a key interface area. Information flow between the builders and the automation people is another one, not just about things like tolerances for floor flatness and locations of load points, and, but things relating to the building and legal compliance like sprinklers and lighting that have to feed through and around the automation kit. Right. Um, the points about building defects remediation where you've got somebody drilling a hole in some metal uh, to fix a problem with the roof and the shavings are dropping down into the wheels of the automation kit um, causing problems and also the, the uh, I think the difference in outlook and attitude between the automation suppliers who are largely Europeans and the British building contractors. Um, and getting the two of them to work together, it, it can be quite a challenge. The continental approach is much more, well, we're working together on a project and risks are shared fairly and reasonably and equitably. Whereas in Britain, we're used to, well, risks are identified at the outset and allocated to one party or another and fairness doesn't come into it. It's a question of who's going to carry the risk and ensure it. Hmm. Um, and the, the interplay between those is, is quite interesting, particularly as regards things like delivery time scales, uh, especially where your building and uh, your automation kit hmm. have to go around one another where you can't just finish the building and then put the kit into it um it's normally more sophisticated than that so yes in interface between the two requires a lot of work and it's it's not just the um the contracts and the dates and what's happening then it's it's the approaches and the attitudes right. of of the different suppliers right. I'm, I'm going to stick on this um on, on the automated aspect and um, um, this one is for you, Ian, it's quite a long question. Um, and we've, we've, we've got, probably got time for one question afterwards. So when we're putting long-term maintenance agreements in place for automated materials handling equipment, how do we manage issues relating to parts becoming obsolete uh, in the future as technology continues to develop? And also how do we guard and maintain it going out of business? <laughs> Blimey, how long have we got? Um, right, so um, yeah, two minutes. Pop, pop, this is about allocating various risks. So let's. So it was the first one parts obsolescence. Yes. So parts obsolescence. Um, if you are looking at it from the customer's point of view, you'd like to put parts obsolescence on the uh, on the OEM. Um, so let's assume we've got a turnkey contract where uh, the manufacturer of the kit is then 
maintaining it under a long-term um, maintenance contract. It might be an operating maintenance, might just be a maintenance contract, or a technical services and maintenance. Um, what you'd want to do, I think, is given, given the life cycle of this kit, is to, is to say to the maintainer, I'm buying an output. I'm buying so, you know, a certain level of productivity from this kit. And frankly, if you want to switch out parts in the future, you want to upgrade your SCADA, or you want to change the way in which a particular wheel works, um, that's fine, but it's on you to do that in a way that doesn't disrupt the output from my, my equipment. Um, so parts obsolescence, easy answer from a customer's point of view, put it on the supplier um, and, and it doesn't increase the cost um, because you, you're buying a contract output for the contract price in the first place. Just remind me of the second point, Simon. It's about the, um, te as technology continues to develop and how okay, do you so guard against the maintainer going out of business? Okay, so, so, so in terms of technology, I mean, similar, similar point on the software and on the tech, what, what I think you would expect is that the, is the OEM should provide patches and, and upgrades to the control software, again, within the price, because that's what you bought. You bought something that will work. Oh. Um, if they move to a completely new level, new version of control software, or if they, for example, don't have their own proprietary software and part of it is bought out and their supplier goes bust or uh, and therefore they need to make changes in there in, in the in the supply in in the control um, uh, management software um, uh, that's a, that's a risk which i think needs to be discussed and allocated as part of the commercial negotiations it really is part of the tendering process you don't really want to trip over these sorts of issues in contract finalization you really probably want to have this nailed down as part of the, the sort of agreement of the, the key commercial terms. But I think you'd find it hard, you'd, you'd be hard pressed to get a supplier, a manufacturer to say that they will, they, they will provide whatever new software they need to provide to keep the system operating for the next 30 years on a free of charge basis from day one. It's a, uh, sorry, that's a very short answer. It's much more complicated than that as it's used. Sure. As I'm sure you can imagine, but it, it, it comes down to making sure you've got all the key issues nailed down at heads of term stage, or you know, or, or during the tendering process, um, rather than tripping over key issues like this um, when you're trying to finalise terms and get the contract in place. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Ian. Good answer to a to a difficult question. I think we can squeeze one more question in, and I'm going to put this to to you, Nigel. So how do we plan for future challenges in the sector when the future itself is so unpredictable? Uh, I think, thanks Simon. I think it's about, um, we've had a useful few years of, of the unexpected happening uh, uh, in unusual ways. So I think, I think businesses are, are, are now in a sort of space where you're constantly, they are constantly anticipating um, what might, what might, Proof challenging down the line. I think it comes down to something we touched on earlier uh, about planning and and, and management uh, and and being able to look at um, uh, things that you know are going to you know that costs are going to be increasing. Hmm. Know that because of Brexit and um, post pandemic and now because of what's going to happen with commodities and raw materials out of Russia and Ukraine, you already know for the next. 18, 24 months, possibly even longer, that, that, that there are things that are, that are afoot that you're going to need to negotiate. So again, speaking to the other people in your supply chain, identifying the risks that you can, as Lindsay was saying, making sure your contract to the extent that it can anticipates or at least provides a framework for dealing with some of these risks. There are all, I mean, it's kind of, nobody knows. And so everybody has to just, you know, use their nose, use their instincts and plan and plan accordingly and, 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 and all you can be sure of is that it won't go according to plan but at least <laughs> you'll be used to uh, uh, being nimble and reacting as you need to, to, to survive um, you know when things change as they inevitably will in ways that we can't foresee. Excellent well we, we probably didn't manage to get all uh, the questions but may I take the opportunity of thanking you all for joining us 
A special thanks to our panel, Nigel, Shashi, Ian, Lindsay, Chris, and Lee for their thoughts and insight. Uh, we will be following up over the next few days with answers to any unanswered questions, details of our next webinar, and a copy of today's session. Once again, big thank you to you all. Um, stay well and keep safe. Thank you.